Greetings Realm Lords, Corbrix here, and on this YouTube channel I have been showing you all how my LEGO War Game works, that I have made out of LEGO Castle and other themes kind of meshed together and adapted into a whole new world that you can play on in a massive LEGO War Game. And I'm really eager to show you guys more units that appear in the Circle of Realms, but before I start to explore the teams in more depth, I wanted to show you all how combat actually looks and functions in the Circle of Realms. And so today we're going to look at a few turns in the Circle of Realms that are filled with combat and action, and we're going to see just how that looks so that I can explain the nitty gritty of combat, some of the more advanced rules into how it plays out, and so we can see how the stats, which I've shown in a previous video, actually function when you're trying to attack and kill other units in the Circle of Realms. So let's imagine that we're in the middle of a game of core here. Our Hawk Knight has just secured for the Cust Kingdom the Oracle. The Oracle is a neutral building that allows the Kingdom player to predict environmental effects across the Circle of Realms. This is a big win for the Cust Kingdom. This is a nice thing for them to have. And they've secured it with not just a Hawk Knight, but a Hawk Knight and also a Kingdom Archer that is on the way. We have Kingdom Archer number one here making his way over to the Oracle. Oh, wait, hold on. We've got an incoming comment here. Why are they called archers and not crossbowmen or arbalists? Well, kingdom crossbowmen doesn't really sound very good to me. I don't know, there's something about it. I don't like that kuh, kuh sound in there. I mean, try saying that five times fast. Kingdom crossbowmen, kingdom crossbowmen, kingdom crossbowmen. Oof, it's rough. As for kingdom arbalists, well, I didn't know that arbalist was a word. So now that I do know that arbalist is a word, I gotta say kingdom arbalist sounds really good. I like it a lot more than Kingdom Archer. It's more specific. It really rolls off the tongue. And so, you know, kudos to you, commenter. Let's just go ahead and cross off Kingdom Archers. Let's call these guys Kingdom Arbalists going forward. And we make that update on the website and everywhere where this name appears. It's a good name. All right, so where were we? Ah, yes, we have a Hawk Knight holding down the Oracle and we have now a Kingdom Arbalist on the way to back him up. But all is not well here in Surla. I forgot to mention that we have some rebel units who are on the way, and they are coming to take the Oracle away from the Kingdom player. So let's go ahead and pop these guys in. We have a rebel militia man here, and he is being backed up by not one, but two rebel woodsmen. Now, as much as the rebellion would like to resolve matters peacefully with the Cust Kingdom, the Kingdom player has just proven that he cannot be trusted. And as a result, they are at war right now in a game of core. And this fight over here for the Oracle is just one of many fights that are happening across the Circle of Realms. Now, our Rebel player goes higher in the initiative, so he's going to go before the Kingdom player even gets a chance to do anything. So let's go ahead and hop in. We're going to imagine that we're starting a new round in the Circle of Realms. It is daytime for the Rebel player. So if you've watched my video on turns and rounds and you remember how weird night is, don't worry about that stuff right now. We'll get to night later. For now, let's just do some day turns and see what the action looks like during the day. So let's see what the rebels do. So our rebel player is first going to issue a unit command to his militia man. We have no extra items on the field or anything like that, so we're not going to worry about rearranging inventory. We're just going to look at how combat and turns are going to function in general here. So our rebel militia man has a movement of three, and that's more than enough for him to move two spaces up and get an attack range of our kingdom arbalist. Since our militia man doesn't have a range, he has to be right up against our arbalist, and he has to be right in front of or to the side of him. He cannot be diagonal, so we cannot have our militia man standing here because he doesn't have a range of one. You need a range of one to be able to attack diagonally in the circle of realms. So we're gonna keep him right here, right in front of this kingdom arbalist. Now that he's moved, he's going to attack, and that means we're gonna roll some dice. So let me rig something together here so you guys can actually see the rolls I'm making. It'll be a lot more interesting that way. Perfect. Now our militia man has a weapon attack of slashing five and a base attack of three, which means we're gonna be rolling the D3 and the D5 to see what his damage is. So if we look at this roll, we rolled a one and a four, making a total attack strength of five. Now our Arbalist still gets an opportunity to defend himself. His armor won't come in handy here because his helmet only blocks blunt damage and the Militia Man is attacking with a slashing weapon, a sword. So all the Arbalist is gonna be able to do is roll his defense of five. And he rolls a two. We have five damage coming in with a defense roll of two. That means our Arbalist is going to take three damage from this attack. And if you've watched my turn video, you may recall that a player gets to take three unit commands with nine heroes in a single turn. And we've only done one so far. 
That means we can still do a unit command with each of the woodsmen. And our rebel player is not gonna pass up that opportunity to use these woodsmen to potentially eliminate this arbalist. Now our woodsmen have a range of five. One, two, three, four, five. That's plenty of range to get to our arbalist, who's only four paces away. When you are attacking an enemy unit, you do need to make sure that your unit can see the enemy unit. This is not an issue in this position. Even though the militiaman is between the arbalist and the woodsman, he's clearly not blocking their view. So with that in mind, let's see if our woodsman can take out this arbalist before he can do anything. Woodsman number one, our lower woodsman here, he's going to start the attack. Now our woodsmen have a weapon attack of piercing two and a base attack of five. So we're gonna roll a d2 and a d5. And let's see how he does. So he rolled a total of four. So this will be four damage to our arbalist, unless our arbalist can roll a four or higher. And our arbalist only has a defense of five, so let's see what he can do. Our arbalist rolls a three, so the arbalist takes another one damage. The arbalist now has four wounds on him. Now our other woodsman, he's actually gonna move forward a little bit. He's gonna move one, two spaces forward. He just wants to be in prime position once the opportunity opens up to go after the Hawk Knight afterwards. And this woodsman is also going to attack the Arbalist. But there's a slight difference between this attack and the last attack. And that slight difference has to do with one of the abilities that these woodsmen have. It might be hard to see from this angle, but our woodsman is actually standing two plates higher than the Arbalist. He is on a slight slope there. So whenever you are fighting in the Circle of Rome, you always want to keep in mind the abilities and special attacks that your units have, because they can completely redefine how a fight's going to turn. So if we look at our woodsman abilities, one of them is tactical positioning, which simply states that when attacking a unit whose space is below the woodsman, the woodsman target receives a minus one penalty to the result of its defense roll. This bonus stacks with that of a normal height advantage too. So this is a nice little perk for our woodsman. So he's gonna perform a normal attack. And let's see what damage he rolls. He rolled another attack of four, just like our previous woodsman. So let's see how our arbalist stacks up against this. He's gonna roll a five, but we're gonna subtract one from it when we're done. So the absolute best he can do is break even with this attack. Now a four normally would have been enough to protect the arbalist from this attack, but because we're gonna subtract one from it, it becomes a three, meaning our arbalist is going to take one more wound. And our arbalist is now half dead already in just one turn. But fortunately for our arbalist, it is now the kingdom player's turn. Our kingdom player's gonna go with the arbalist first. They wanna see if the arbalist can try to get a good hit in there. It's gonna determine how willing they are to commit their hawk knight to this fight. So we're gonna begin by turning around our arbalist. That is going to take up the movement of the arbalist. This has to be done during the movement phase of the arbalist's unit command. So we are technically moving there when we are turning him around. The reason why we're turning him around is because the arbalist needs to be able to see his target. And whenever we're looking at line of sight, we wanna see if our targets can see each other. So we're gonna measure from the face of our arbalist, which points out this way. And basically how this works is a unit can see other units that are within 180 degree radius from their face, assuming there's no obstructions in the way. So our arbalist can see anybody in this whole span, starting from over here, flipping all the way over uh, to that direction. Sorry, I'm really, really struggling to hold that elegantly for you. But basically, he can't see anyone who's behind him in this position. So now that our arbalist is facing the right way, he's got to decide who he wants to attack. Does he want to attack this militia man, or does he want to attack the woodsman? And when we're making a decision like this, the absolute most important thing to consider is the armor that is on the units that we are attacking. So if we look at this militia man, he's got a shield and a helmet, and that helmet does block six piercing damage, which means our arbalist can't even hurt him. Our arbalist is not going to get through that six armor. So instead, we're going to have to settle for shooting a woodsman. Now the woodsmen don't have any piercing armor. Their helmets only block hacking damage. So we're good to go if we make this attack. Now, as I showed in my video that went over the arbalists back when I was calling them kingdom archers, these are some of the weakest units in the game. They have a base attack of one and a piercing attack of two. So what this means is that we're going to roll a D2 and then we're just gonna add one to it when we're done because there's, you know, there's no such thing as a D1 or, or if there is, it's just a block that you drop. So yeah, we're just gonna add one to it. Fortunately, he rolled the best he can. He rolled a two plus one, so a total of three damage going out to the woodsman. And we're shooting this woodsman right here, by the way. Woodsman number one. So woodsman number one has three damage incoming, but fortunately he has a defense of six, so the rebel player is not too worried about this. Let's see what he does. And he rolls a three. That three is gonna match the other three. Bam, our woodsman is totally fine. Now at this point, our hawk knight has a decision to make. 
And just like Prince Jalen, he is a brave fellow. He's willing to charge into battle to help defend his Arbalus buddy. Hawk Knights have a movement of four. Now, if our Hawk Knight wants to join the fray, normally he would have to move down this ladder, one, and then two spaces here. And then if he wants to move up diagonally into this space up here, he's actually gonna to need to spend an additional move because there is an elevation difference greater than two pegs. Let me try to show that for you. Yeah, there's an elevation difference. Oop. A little bit hard to see here from my angle, but there's an elevation difference greater than two pegs between where he is standing and where he is going. So it would cost him two move. Uh-oh. So it would cost him two move to move up here to be close to that militia man. But if he does that, if I zoom back out for you to see the situation, he actually doesn't get an attack range because he's now diagonal from our militia man. And you can't attack diagonally unless you have a range of one or higher. So we're going to, have to scrap that plan. But fortunately, the Hawk Knight does have an ability that works in his favor. He has Visage of the Hawk, which allows him to ignore fall damage. So he can actually just jump from this space to this space, moving one space diagonally without taking any fall damage because of that special Visage of the Hawk ability. So this means he moved one. He's going to move two more to get up into position here. He still has one more space left. So he's gonna move here and now, bam, he is able to attack the militia man and back up his buddy, the Arbalist. Now our kingdom player thinks he's so clever here. He's gotten his Hawk Knight down into a position where he can attack the militia man and he didn't take any fall damage and he did it all in one turn. Smart guy, right? Well, actually, our kingdom players made two critical mistakes. And mistake number one has to do with a concept I haven't explained yet. It's called momentum. So if you recall, our Hawk Knight had to move up just before attacking this militia man. He had to climb up to rain. He had to slow down a little bit as he was moving up. And so this militia man is gonna have a defensive bonus because of momentum. Now, momentum is something that only melee units can get or lose when they are attacking. Units that have a range of two or higher, these are units that are shooting bows and arrows, or they're like kind of firing guns or something. These units don't worry about momentum because quite frankly, it doesn't really matter how fast the unit's moving when they shoot that bow, when they shoot a gun or whatever, that, that projectile is being shot out by the weapon itself. It has nothing to do with the force behind the body of our unit when they're attacking. But for melee units, we always need to think about momentum. And the way this works is a unit has positive, negative, or no momentum. A unit has positive momentum when they move down an elevation. So our Hawk Knight actually first gained momentum. He was standing up here, he leapt down here, and that means he gains momentum. And he's gonna have positive momentum until he reaches the end of his move, unless something changes. And something did change, he then moved up elevation. And since he moved up elevation, he no longer had positive momentum, but he lost momentum. He's got negative momentum. And in his last move, there was no change. So he's going to continue to have negative momentum until the end of his turn. Since he's lost momentum before attacking the militia man, the militia man gets plus one added on to his defense after he rolls his defense die. It's important to keep in mind that for momentum, it doesn't matter how great the elevation difference is. Even though our Hawk Knight went down, a great distance to move between this first space and his second space. Since he had to go up to move after that, he still is gonna have negative momentum. It doesn't matter this is a much smaller climb than this was a fall. So that's critical mistake number one. Critical mistake number two has to do with something we already saw earlier when we looked at the militia man's abilities and stats. Our militia man, if we remember, has slashing nine armor on his shield. This militia man is going to be impossible to injure with an attack from our Hawk Knight. But you know what? Our Rebel player doesn't have to reveal this to the Kingdom player. They don't have to say any of this stuff to the Kingdom player until it's too late. They can wait until the Kingdom player has declared that they are doing an attack. And once the Kingdom player has declared they are attacking a particular unit, they are committed to rolling at least once in that attack. Once they've made that commitment, then our Rebel player can reveal what's happened. This might sound a little bit harsh, but the reality is that both players can access the unit database. Both players can see how much armor these units have. And our Kingdom player even saw the armor of the Militia Man earlier when he was taking a unit command with his Arbalist. So our Kingdom player declares that he's attacking with his Hawk Knight. He's gonna try a Hawk Strike on the Militia Man. Hawk Strike allows the Kingdom player to perform two attacks in one unit command instead of one. So our Kingdom player thinks they were pretty crafty, pretty clever here. It's at this point though, when the Rebel player's like, hey, hey, yo, I've got a slashing shield. You can't even 
hurt me, you silly hawk knight. So our kingdom player then rages for a moment. They kind of throw up their arms and hopefully they don't actually flip any tables over because that would cause some like massive damage for me. But you know, they're gonna be upset. But once they've calmed down, they realize that they are committed to doing an attack. They have to follow through and they're probably gonna end up actually taking damage on this attack instead of dealing damage. This by the way is one of the most satisfying feelings ever when you are a defender and you just get to say, whoa, looks like you screwed up big time. It feels kind of like Yu-Gi-Oh playing his trap card or something. On the flip side, when you're the attacker and this happens, oh my gosh, it's it hurts. It's like being stabbed in the chest. It gets your blood like kind of really boiling as you're sitting there thinking, how could I let this happen? Why didn't I look at the unit sheet? How can I salvage this? Which of course is all the more satisfying for you to watch if you're not that player. So let's get our roller back on the field here. Our Hawk Knights do have a base attack of three and a slashing attack of five. So let's see what that roll ends up being. This roll ends up being a three, which is completely absorbed by our Militiaman's nine slashing armor. Now at this point you might be wondering, why even bother rolling the defense die as the Militiaman? Well, there's a big reason why the Rebel player is still gonna want to do this. And that reason is that when someone is attacking on an adjacent space, and keep in mind an adjacent space is any space directly in front of, to the right, left, or behind a unit then that unit can actually be damaged by a defense roll. Our Militiaman can block the attack and do a quick counter or parry and repost or something like that. And in doing so, he can hurt the Hawk Knight on the Hawk Knight's turn. And in a situation like this, he can hurt him quite a bit. He gets to roll a defense of eight. And he gets a plus one bonus on top of that. So our Militiaman is gonna roll. He gets a five plus one. That is six damage against our Hawk Knight, meaning that both the Hawk Knight and the Arbalist are halfway or more than halfway dead. And our Rebel player hasn't taken any damage yet. My friends, if you're enjoying this video, please like it and subscribe to this channel for more content. I have so many things to talk to you guys about this game and I have barely scratched the surface here. So please subscribe to see what else I've got in store. So needless to say, things are not looking good for the Kingdom player, but their turn's over now. And so now it's going to become nighttime and we're going to turn our attention over once again to the Rebels. And remember that at nighttime, it's just a little bit harder to deal damage from both an attacker and a defender. Now, despite it being night, things are still looking up for the rebel player this turn. The kingdom units are already half dead, and these rebel units are really good at killing this Arbalest. The Arbalest has no protection against them. But this Hawk Knight, this Hawk Knight's gonna be a bigger problem. And our rebel player is a little bit craftier than the kingdom player. He sees that that Hawk Knight is loaded in armor, so he takes a look at the unit page and he realizes, hmm, this Hawk Knight has six piercing armor on his breastplate and three slashing armor on his helmet. Unfortunately, that means he has armor against both the Woodsman and the Militiaman. But that armor against the Militiaman is significantly lower. So he decides he's gonna go with his Woodsman first. He wants to try to kill off this Arbalist. If he gets lucky, maybe he can do it with one Woodsman instead of both Woodsmen freeing up one for another attack against the Hawk Knight, potentially with a lucky roll dealing some damage. Now our Rebel player is mindful of that bonus that his Woodsmen get just from being even slightly higher than their targets. So he's gonna move Woodsman number two in the back here so that Woodsman number two is in a good position to attack the Arbalist from a slightly higher point. And Woodsman number two is gonna open up with his attack. Now because it is nighttime, we need to consider the precision rating on our attack. So our Woodsman would normally roll a weapon attack of two and a base attack of five. But because they have a precision rating of three and it's nighttime, we are gonna reduce the higher of those two dice by three. So instead of a base attack of five, we're gonna have a base attack of two, which basically means we're gonna roll the D2 twice. So let's see what we can get. We get two plus one for a total attack of three damage. Now that might not be a lot, but remember these woodsmen have a precision rating of three. Now, if you watched my stats video, you would know that precision rating matters for a few reasons. Yes, it affects how much damage you deal at night, but maybe far more interesting than that, your precision rating is what determines when you score a critical hit. In the Circle of Realms, anytime you roll a multiple of your precision rating, then you score a critical hit. So in this case, this would be a three, six, or nine for our Rebel Woodsman. And since we did roll a three, we are getting a critical hit on our Arbalist. It's not like Dungeons and Dragons. A critical hit's not a one in 20 chance. They occur a lot more often in the Circle of Realms, and they vary from unit to unit and some units are better at scoring them than others. When a unit scores a critical hit, the defender has to roll half their defense. 
and that is rounded down if they have an odd number. So our arbalist would normally have a defense of five. Now he himself is only going to have a defense of two. So let's see what he ends up rolling. He rolls a one. That's pretty unfortunate because thanks to the woodsman's tactical positioning ability, this roll just became a zero. So this means our arbalist is going to take three more damage. Our second woodsman is going to try to shoot him and finish him off. If you can finish off that arbalist, then that frees up our militia man to deal with the hawk knight. Once again, because it's night, we're gonna roll a base attack of two and a weapon attack of two. So we get a one plus a one. So a total attack of two damage. That's definitely a bad roll, and now the Arbalist only needs to roll a two or higher to be able to block this attack. Really, normally he'd be able to roll a one, but don't forget, because of tactical positioning, a one would become a zero in this situation. So we need to roll at least a two so that that would go down to a one, and he could safely block the damage. So let's roll our Arbalist's defense of five and see what happens. Oof, that's a one on the Arbalist which again, because of tecto positioning, becomes a zero. So we got our two minus zero, deals two damage to the Arbalist. Our Arbalist is no more. He has been killed and is removed from the battlefield. This is exactly what our rebel player wanted. And so now he takes his militiaman and he turns him to face the Hawk Knight. And he is so tempted to attack, he's ready to strike him or maybe even run down the hill and get a momentum bonus while attacking him. But then he stops and he realizes, he thinks to himself, wait a second, this Hawk Knight has a lot of armor against my attack. And since we'll be attacking at nighttime, we've got to realize that our attack is only going to be a maximum of slashing five damage. Against the Hawk Knight's armor, that's almost certainly not going to hurt the Hawk Knight, and there's a good chance it'll result in our militia man getting hurt instead. This is why it's so important to match up armor against the units that you're fighting. So if you're fighting units with swords, you want to have units with slashing armor. If you're fighting units with bows and arrows, you want to have units with piercing armor, and so on and so forth. And likewise, when you are attacking enemy units, you want to have weapons that cut through their armor. So if your targets have slashing armor, you don't want to be attacking them with swords. So for this reason, it's generally a good idea to have a variety of units near each other, not just the same unit type and that's it. And it's also a good idea to go around the map and pick up different items that you can use to change your unit's attack types, even if it means lowering the maximum damage output of that unit. So Rebel Player is like, you know what, let's just leave that Militia Man there and we'll deal with his Hawk Knight on my next turn. Now, it's nighttime. The Kingdom Player certainly can't attack that Militia Man. He's not going to do any damage to him. But these Woodsmen only have hacking armor. And so what our Hawk Knight is going to do is he's going to move himself up into a better position here. Once again, he's taking a momentum penalty, but that's okay. The Woodsmen do not have any armor against his attack type. He's not too worried about this attack. Now our Hawk Knight could do a Hawk Strike again, but if he does a Hawk Strike, his precision rating will be five. And since it's nighttime, he really can't afford to have a precision rating that high. So he's just gonna do a standard attack, which would be a normal weapon attack of five and a base attack of three. Because it's night, we're going to reduce that weapon attack by his normal precision rating. So we're going to subtract three from that attack of five. So now he's going to roll a two and a three for his damage. And let's see what he cooks up. He rolled a total of five. It's a pretty good roll. It's the highest roll he could do. Let's see how our woodsman stacks up against it. Our woodsman has a defense of six, so he is quite capable. And he's getting a plus one bonus to that defense. So let's see what happens. Our Woodsman rolled a five, which is going to match the five of our Hawk Knight with that plus one bonus because of the momentum penalty of the Hawk Knight. So we've got a defense of six versus an attack of five. Now that means that our Woodsman would normally end up dealing one damage to our Hawk Knight, but because it is night, we're going to reduce that damage dealt by the precision rating. So instead of it being one damage to the Hawk Knight, that's gonna go right back down to zero. And so our Hawk Knight's not really able to accomplish anything this turn, but our Kingdom player has one last thing he can do. This doesn't have anything to do with over here, but if we zoom out and move around the map a little bit, we will see that the Kingdom player is bringing in reinforcements. He has a hero on his way, not just any hero, the noble Prince Jalen de Leon. And this guy doesn't mess around, least of all with rebels. And so our kingdom player is going to move the prince four spaces forward. One, two, three, four. So that the prince can help out his hawk knight, or at least arrive in time so that the hawk knight's sacrifice is not in vain. 
And so the pressure's on for our Rebel player. He has to defeat this Hawk Knight. And not only that, he's gotta get his units in a pretty good position to try to fight the Prince. The Prince is way more dangerous than a common Hawk Knight, and so they're gonna to want to use the terrain to their advantage as much as possible when they try to fend off the Prince. So this brings us to our day turn, and for our day turn, our militia man is going to move into a better position. He is going to actually move himself down and around our Hawk Knight, putting him in this nifty position because now that our militia man has moved down, he gets a momentum bonus. So he's gonna be doing a full attack to the Hawk Knight because it's day and our Hawk Knight is going to be suffering a defense penalty thanks to that momentum. So let's not forget that our militia men have a base attack of three and a weapon attack of five. Well, let's see how he does. It looks like our militia man has rolled a total of eight. That is the strongest attack our militia man can roll. And it's an attack that will score a critical hit because eight is a multiple of the four precision rating. So our Hawk Knight's really in trouble. We've got eight damage coming in. Fortunately, our Hawk Knight's helmet will block three of that. So our Hawk Knight only has five damage coming in towards him, but our Hawk Knight's defense of six is being cut in half. So he only gets to roll this D3 right here. And we're gonna subtract one from the result of it, thanks to that momentum bonus. So let's see how our Hawk Knight does. He rolled a two. Minus one is going to be a defense of one. One from five damage still results in four damage, and that is enough to kill our Hawk Knight. Meaning that just like that, thanks to a few good decisions and a little bit of luck on the part of the Rebel player, the Rebel player has dealt with the kingdom units that were holding down this Oracle. It's so tempting for that Rebel player to celebrate, but don't forget Prince Jalen is on his way. And we'll see how this unfolds in a future video. I'm gonna do one more video that kind of breaks down combat terms because there are a few more advanced concepts that I didn't go over in this one. We've still gotta go over fortifying units, height advantage, attacks of opportunity, and everyone's favorite, dismemberment. So stay tuned for that video. And don't forget that you can actually read all of the rules I went over here in the guide at www.circleofrealms.com. Otherwise, my friends, thanks for watching. Until next time, be happy, be healthy, be well, and I'll see you around here in the Circle of Realms.